Good morning. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to uh, uh, the Phil Fisher Crawl uh, Paris Arbitration Week event. We're delighted to have you here on this uh, sunny Parisian morning, um, and uh, we uh, we assume that we're your all construction disputes uh, aficionados if you're here early in the morning in a very, very busy Paris Arbitration Week. Um, the purpose of our uh, event and of our panel discussion today is to um, uh, discuss construction disputes, particularly in energy projects, um, go through some of the common uh, pitfalls, uh, issues that may give rise to disputes from the beginning till the end of a construction project, and uh, with our very diverse panel that I will introduce in a second, we hope to be able to give uh, and to share with you uh, a complete 360 overview of the life of a construction uh, project and issues that may give rise to um, disputes. So without further ado, I will present our four uh, speakers. Um, Dan Preston, right next to me, he's the head of construction at Phil Fisher. Uh, based in London. Dan has extensive experience advising some of UK's largest suppliers and purchasers on contentious and non-contentious matters on construction, engineering, and facilities management projects. Uh, Luke Korovesis, he's a director at Crawl. Uh, Luke is a senior director and delay expert in the expert services practice of Crawl, based in the Paris office. He's a mechanical engineer from uh, his background and project management professional and specializes in forensic construction programming and project um, management. Uh, Françoise Lefebvre is an international arbitrator and member of the ICC Court for Belgium. She was the worldwide litigation and arbitration head of Linklaters from 2007 to 2010 before chairing the global international arbitration practice of the firm until 2016 and uh, she's now a full-time uh, arbitrator uh, with extensive experience in construction law, contract law, corporate disputes. And Maria Irene Peruccio, uh, a former colleague of mine, is a double qualified lawyer, resident in Paris and in Milan, where she works as an in-house counsel and is the head of international affairs for Europe and Americans and Americas of the We Build uh, group. Formerly, you will know um, We Build as Salini in Pregillo. Um, Maria Irene previously worked at Whiten Case, where we had the pleasure to work together, and then she moved on to work at the ICC um, Secretariat in the Swiss Italian team. So, this is our uh, very diverse uh, panel, and I'm saying diverse because we wanted to give you this complete 360 overview uh, from the point of view of an arbitrator, uh, a lawyer specializing in construction uh, disputes and construction contracts, uh, a delay expert, uh, someone who has a hands-on uh, experience uh, with a mechanical and engineering background, and of course, the um, viewpoint of from a representative of a major construction uh, company. So, um, Welcome. Uh, we'll start with uh, approaching uh, a construction project from the very, very beginning, how to set up 
um, a contract, uh, the first stage of, uh, of, of a construction uh, project is uh, goes to negotiating and drafting. And there are some very common pitfalls um, in contract drafting, uh, which Dan and Francoise will discuss uh, shortly. So, um, Dan, I'll start with you. Are there any key uh, clauses in construction contracts that commonly give rise to disputes? Thank you, Marily. So, yeah, as, as Marily said, for sort of my sins, I do both sides, the contentious side and the drafting side. So it means you get to ruin the draft and then, then argue about it as well. Um, I should have said as well, we, we want this to be interactive. So please, if people have got war stories, questions, etc., please do sort of ask as we as we go along. We, we also hope to have some time for questions and answers at the end as well. But um, from my perspective, the areas that we tend to really focus on in terms of negotiating and those that throw up most of the disputes, I would I would sort of coin as the, the contractor claim clauses. So those that relate to variations and then the extension of time and, and loss and expense provisions. Um, so con considering variations first and, and what I mean by that or where we see the disputes, almost all all of the standard contracts require variations to be instructed in writing or to at least be confirmed back by the contractor in writing. You then go on in most of the provisions, in most of the standard forms that we work with to have requirements for the contractor then to tell the employer or the engineer about the um, programming and cost implications within a certain period of time. So, for example, some of the big contracts, um, if if the employer doesn't uh, request a proposal or a quotation up front, contractor generally has 28 days to inform the employer of the cost, uh, resourcing method and program implications. Under the NEC suites, it's eight weeks from awareness to notify compensation events and ICME contractor claims are a lot tighter than 14 days from occurrence generally. Now, in my experience, what then happens is the employer goes on to, first of all, shorten those time periods, um, and then they go on to make the form of notification and sometimes service requirements quite prescriptive. Um, so for example, we've, we often see that certain notices from the contractor have to be served by post, even in this day and age. Um, or by a specific uh, mechanism, whether that's using the, the project management um, tools or, or otherwise. And then, of course, what you get is the main contract level flowed down into subcontract level. All of those time periods, which were already quite tight, are reduced further. Um, and the, the, to allow the contractor to, uh, to pass them up. Um, obviously, as a lawyer, completely understand the need for control um, on projects. You can't have uh, just wide, wide and unlimited variations and then an employer not understanding the, uh, the, the cost consequences until the end. But for me, the, the big issue comes when the parties spend a lot of time drafting these clauses, or sometimes, to be honest, don't even look at them um, and just accept them. But then when you get onto site, um, invariably, they depart from the agreed process. Now, excuses we often see as uh, as lawyers are straightforward. People don't understand what they've signed up to, uh, or they don't know what they've signed up to. Uh, you get a second level where they can't practically comply with either the complexity of the clause or the sheer volume of instructions that they're receiving. Um, or thirdly, or some, sometimes in combination, what's agreed at the outset is actually too rigid and too slow to allow the project to uh, to proceed as it should. So what then happens is the lawyer's favourite, um, the parties talk to each other and essentially say, let's put the contract in the drawer. We're not going to need it. We're not going to fall out. We're, we're best friends. And, uh, and they just ignore it. So um, this then leads on, and I'm sure Francoise has had uh, experiences of this as well. But when we when we come to argue variations um, uh, clauses, when we should be focusing on is something in or outside the scope, and what are the cost and um, what are the cost uh, com 
sequences of that and the programming consequences, you actually have this first layer of, of um, argument, which I think adds to everyone's cost and probably adds to your frustration <laughs> as an arbitrator. But you have this first layer of argument where we're, we're essentially dealing with time bars. Did the contractor notify it properly? If not, then you deal with arguments around waiver, you deal with arguments around estoppel. Lawyers and clients often come up with arguments around course of dealings and variations of contracts um, on, on that way. So, I mean, for, for me, and, and these, are, these are common, of course, not just variations, but when you get to loss and expense provisions and, and extension of times, there, there are similar, if not tighter, um, time scales and provisions that you have to deal with. So, I from, from my perspective, if you're going to spend the time negotiating these clauses and, as I say, completely understand the need for them, I think it's it's vital that you comply with them um, or you go sort of 360 and you, you make them easier to uh, mm -hmm. easier to comply with and, and spend less time negotiating them. I don't know if you, you've got anything to add to that, Francois. I don't think in my 14 years practice I have ever seen one case where these periods, deadlines, number of days, whatever, have been complied with. Not once. No, and I think that often, and as I say, the, the, the standard forms deal with these things differently, but it, it's not just the time period. I mean, the, the time periods sometimes run from the event, sometimes they run from a, uh, your know. knowledge of the event. Sometimes they run from your when you reasonably should have had knowledge of an event. So there is always that subjective layer. But I think invariably, I, I agree, Francois, we 90% of the time you have arguments about whether they've been complied with or, or they or they haven't been complied with. And I have to say, I think the last I can't actually name the last variations dispute I had where you didn't have this sort of argument at the um, at the outset. So for me, first one would be variations and provisions. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. And thanks, uh, Francoise, for confirming that these are indeed the issues that you see uh, as being problematic in your uh, practice. Now, staying with this, in, in this initial uh, phase of setting up the contract, um, I wanted to uh, ask you, Francoise, uh, whether you think that uh, contractors uh, who may be um, in you know, take the the form of an uh, investor, uh, let's say, in, in another performing a contract in another country, whether they can take advantage of any potentially um, relevant investment treaty provisions at this very beginning of setting up the contract in order to make sure that they will have the protection that they wish for uh, throughout the whole uh, performance of the contract. Thank you, Mari. This is indeed an area where um, I think opportunities are missed. Um, recently and over the last 10 years, we've heard a lot, we've uh, listened to a lot of conferences, we've read a lot of things about bilateral investment treaty arbitration, etc. It is being used, that's obvious, but I don't think it's being used to its fullest extent. Not that I mean that it's a panacea, far from that. We know that there are countries where it won't work, in the EU, for example, that's finished. Um, it is perceived, and it is, as an expensive procedure. It's also perceived as a last resort procedure because when you get to it, it means you've exhausted everything else and it's really the desperation you know, move. But still, sometimes that's the only one you have available. So it is worth thinking about it when you structure your project. And it is worth sitting down, determining whether there is a bilateral treaty between your country and the country of the contractor and the country of the owner, whether what you're going to do will qualify as an investment, if there is no bilateral treaty or the conditions are not good enough, is there a bilateral treaty with another country where you could set up a company, can you benefit from this uh, bilateral treaty if you just set up a company for the purpose of carrying out uh, this project. There are lots of conditions, of course, that have to be examined, but it's worth it. And you, you may come to the conclusion that it's not worth it, that you cannot find a suitable structure, um, that what you will do will not qualify in any event as an investment, but I would still dedicate sometimes 
at the beginning during the project phase you know when project lawyers are discussing and negotiating it thinking about it to see and also whether you cannot benefit from the most favored nation clause of another treaty that would allow you to extend the protection to your own structure so again it's not a panacea it will not apply to every case but it's worth reflecting about it I think that's yes important. yes thank you yes um i i think it's also really important to realize also that for investment treaty arbitration you have to show that the the breach is of international law mm -hmm. unless obviously you look at the umbrella clause and it the contractual breach so I, I see a lot of like jurisdictional hurdles um, and then if you can pr prove obviously that it's a breach of the international law then you can yes ask. and of course you can only benefit from the protections that are in the <coughs> treaty right and not every breach and contractual breach will fall into it that's obvious but you know sometimes the situation gets so dire that you can indeed invoke this sort of uh, level of, of breach to your benefit thank you uh Francoise. I, i'm wondering whether you hear us without the microphone i think yes it's okay so it may be easier actually not to um, so, going back to the contract, uh, in large construction projects, the contracts are accompanied by a series of uh, schedules, supporting, technical documentation, and sometimes the various terms among all those schedules and uh, annexes might give rise to conflicting terms, conflicting definitions, issues. Um, Dan, do you, do you see that there are any common issues that arise out of these um, documents that are usually you know uh, packed together with the main contract yeah so i think actually i'd i disagree with one thing that you said there which is that they usually are uh, misaligned in my experience there's always at least one contradictory provision within the technical specification uh, as compared to the, uh, the the contract itself and we're, we're often, as lawyers, asked to review, report on the contractual terms. Um, I'm not saying we should, because I don't understand some of the technical specifications uh, any more than the, uh, the other lawyers in the team. But sometimes you, you review the contract, you can highlight all the risks, um, and then you find that your client hasn't actually properly read the technical terms. And there might actually be some conflicting contractual provisions in there. Now, obviously, most contracts these days have hierarchy of documents clauses. They have provisions that are meant to deal with, with conflicts. But actually, the court's approaches and tribunal's approaches to these are, are actually to see if you can make them work independently um, in the first instance. So, I mean, I, I don't know about the others on the panel, but actually the times where you're arguing or trying to invoke a hierarchy <laughs> Tools. Um, uh, the, the times you successfully argue that, I think, are relatively few and far between. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, in the construction and energy industry, we, we now have a, a quite famous UK Supreme Court decision in, in the Hogarth case, where essentially there was conflicting fitness for purpose provisions, 20-year uh, life, uh, design life service provisions hidden in the, or put in the technical data. And there was also along that obligations to carry out works in accordance with what were thought to be um, uh, accepted international standards. Now, obviously, in, in Hogarth, there was a, 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 an error in one of those standards, which meant that even though the contractor complied with that, they didn't um, produce something that had a 20 year design. And the, and the court in that instance did sort of look at them separately and say, yes, you were, you were under an obligation to provide that design life. Now, I've, I've had examples of this um, myself, and as I say, it's, it's actually invariably on every project we look at, that you think you're agreeing to some provisions and you're restricting your liability under a main contract by including whether it's a cap on liability or if it's uh, linking something back to um, a reasonable skill and care obligation. Whereas there might be a service life, there might be a fitness for purpose obligation hidden within the technical documents. And the, the 125 or Broad Street case that I dealt with had something very similar in it as well. Um, what we've seen, and sort of one of my pet hates really, is um, contractors 
try and get around this by sometimes just saying, okay, well, here's the employer's requirements. And rather than trying to negotiate the employer's requirements and, and tell the, or get to a position where everyone knows what they're delivering, everyone knows what's, what's expected, they try and put as part of their proposals or they try and insert into the employer's requirements a one or two page schedule or 20 or 30 page schedule that essentially says, okay, we accept everything, but here's our clarifications. Now, it just last week, I had a contractor client come to me with this, um, and thankfully it was at the outset, but said, Dan, I, I, we need to rely on our, um, on our provisions here. Do you think my clarification in my schedule is, is sufficient? So we then go on to have a discussion about, okay, well, how have you incorporated it? I put it at the front of the employee requirements. Okay, how have you incorporated it into the contract? Mm -hmm. Well, it's part of the ERs. <laughs> okay. So then you go through the process of trying to put an operative provision in the contract, to try and exclude other provisions from it. And I mean, we've, we've seen very recently, um, as those that you work in the UK construction sector, we, we obviously have a, a real focus at the moment on um, fire disputes, cladding disputes, building safety. And that is producing for us a, a real sort of stream of case law. Um, some of which has unintended consequences. So, for example, there was a there was a case heard by the TCC earlier this year, um, coming out of the fire safety staff, where unhelpfully um, the subcontractor concerned was insolvent and they weren't represented in the case, and the employer and the contractor had actually already settled. So it was all about what they could flow down. Uh, so, without hearing argument from the subcontractor, the, the court <coughs> reached a decision where. Essentially, they said that although the subcontractor had included certain clarifications and said they wouldn't be doing certain things, other parts of the architectural and technical specifications included that, and the clarification wasn't enough to override it. So I think there's a, there's a real risk for parties that if you don't get everything aligned at the outset and spend as much time negotiating and talking about the technical documents as you do the legal documents, you're going to end up with these disputes coming out and you could end up with some consequences that you just haven't legislated for. Yes, and speaking of disputes, uh, one of the favorites, I think, uh, clauses in a construction contract, for especially for arbitration lawyers, is the dispute resolution clause. So, um, François, do you have any, uh, any views on, um, on or recommendations or how, on how parties should be approaching dispute resolution clauses in order to um, better uh, manage and anticipate uh, any disputes that will come out of all those issues that you have both mentioned. Well, there would be lots of things to say about the dispute resolution clauses, but one of the things I would like to point out is still the lack of attention which is uh, given to the drafting of the dispute resolution clause. Everybody knows that energy construction situations and projects involve a lot of different parties intervening at a lot of different levels. And I still see so often arbitration clauses that are not compatible with each other at the different levels. Um, it's quite a while ago, it's about what, 10 or 15 years ago, I had to work on a dispute that originated from the construction of a big international airport somewhere. And there were a major consortium at the top, which covered two sub-consortia, which of course had a lot of had uh, contractors and an infinite amount of subcontractors. Well, there was not one dispute resolution clause that was compatible with another one. The language <coughs> was different, that you can say nobody cares. The law applicable, right, we can still live with several laws applicable. The arbitration institutions were different, the seats were different, and the rules for the composition of the arbitral tribunals were different. It was just a, a beautiful example. I thought I've never seen anything as badly drafted as that. <laughs> And, um, and the client could not really work out that indeed that was going to be a problem, right? Trying to have every party responsible for the delay brought together before the same arbitrators. And guess what? They did not agree when the disputes had arisen to derogate from what they had agreed upon at the time of signature. Big surprise. 
how would you think it got resolved? They had to settle. Yeah. So you're going to tell me that's the best way of getting to a settlement, right? You create a monster, which <laughs> right? you will go for the pathological route and then you increase the chance of settlement. Of course, it may appear interesting afterwards at the end, but that was not really the way that the, the client wanted to approach it at the beginning. So please pay attention to this sort of situation. What I see also is that sometimes people think that they are drafting clauses that will be compatible, but they're drafting in a way too simple for a complex multi-party, multi-contract um, project. I know that the rules of the various arbitration institutions have changed, have all evolved in the last decade or so to facilitate <coughs> joint consolidation. But still, I mean, with the ICC clause Article 6, if you want to make sure that you're going to be able to attract somebody, I think the reasoning is so complicated that I never know where I'm going to get before I get to the end of the reasoning. So it has improved, but we're not there yet, and it's not something obvious. So what I have done several times when I was counsel, and which did work, I saw it uh, working, was drafting a separate arbitration agreement, which regulates, of course, chooses one set of rules, um, one procedure, one arbitral tribunal, and which regulated all the issues of joinder, consolidation, intervention, whatever. And in the various contracts and some contracts, the parties would refer in the dispute resolution clause to that agreement, and they would sign that separate agreement. And basically, you had one arbitral tribunal able to rule on all the disputes of all the parties who had signed the agreement. It required a bit of malaxation of the parties at the beginning to convince them that it was, you know, not what they were used to, but nevertheless, a good idea. Um, I managed to uh, implement that in several contracts, including in PPP, which was all the rage in Belgium, um, mm -hmm. and for the construction, I think, of prisons, you know, sexy subject, but anyway. Um, and I saw it work at work once, and actually, you ironed out all these preliminary issues that you can lose so many months on in situations where multi-party, multi-contract has not been thought out properly at the beginning. Thank you, uh, Francoise. It will be, uh, would be interesting maybe uh, afterwards at the Q&A to see if others have had experience with this idea of the separate arbitration agreement, which I have seen in practice being a very useful tool to bypass some of the of the common issues and be more efficient in the in the planning. Um, before we move to our next uh, topic and and the next phase in a construction project, is there anything else, Dan and Consuelo, you would like to just raise in this uh, uh, setting up the contract uh, the contract phase? I would say, I guess for me, it's not so much something in the contract, but the, the other areas where we really do see disputes arising and and really just something for for thought for. Q and A later, maybe. Um, so there will be maybe three things. One, um, value value engineering processes and those sort of not really being reflected uh, in terms of the risk profile in the contracts. So you've got this real mismatch where essentially you get into contract, then you have this huge value engineering project to try and save uh, a lot of budget, but you don't really have any risk transfer, mm -hmm. and the employer sometimes expects. What it originally signed up for for the for the lower mm -hmm. sum that it's that it's um, that it's agreeing. Um, connected with that is novel materials. People who want to do things separate, differently, and invariably it, it throws out and um, throws out issues. Whether that's nickel sulfide inclusions in glazing, whether that's uh, thermal capabilities as we try and get smaller and smaller in terms of the bit, the buildings, and um, and all the fire issues that have arisen out of those. Um, and then the, the third real sort of bugbear or, or issue for me is a lot of the standard form contracts we use, whether it's FIDIC, like I mean, the NEC, there are really important roles for engineers and project managers. When you see employers try and take those roles in-house without actually having the expertise mm -hmm. to do so, I think you're just on a sort of side into nothing and your project's never going to go well. Um, just to echo what you said, Dan, 
what I found incredible that contractors accept is that the engineer, sometimes it's just an employee or a contractor of the owner and is paid by the owner. I mean, how can you expect for one half of a second that you're going to have an independent approach? I mean, yes, they can always claim they will, but they never do. So when you have that sort of situation, you know there's going to be problems. Um, and, the, and beyond the purely legal approach, for me, the, the, one of the major causes of these delays and uh, additional costs in the contract is the way that it's negotiated at the beginning in terms of commercial terms. Very often, the deadline is untenable. Everybody knows that. The prices have been squashed so much. I mean, it's really nice to negotiate and then come out with savings. Yeah, except they're going to be claimed at the end. Everybody's got to earn money to survive. Huh? It's very, very practical. And I'm not here advocating for contractors who are going to charge you through the nose for stuff they don't do. But there is a level where it's an incompressible cost of what you're going to have to deliver if you want to deliver a good quality or reasonable below that, it's not going to work. There's also this economic aspect, and I know it's a question of the market. Huh? Uh, how much pressure can you put on the market and still get offers and go on with them? I'm not a negotiator of contracts. I've always seen them right at the other end of their lives. Um, but it's so obvious that the <coughs> these of the problems existed from the original situation. I think we're, we're terrible at this whole race to the bottom aspect. Yes, yes. And you think, I mean, taking the, the UK construction industry, I mean, what sort of model would you uh, approach where you take on these huge liabilities, all hoping to make somewhere between 1% and 3% as a profit margin? And it just never ceases to amaze me. Because remuneration is not high enough yeah, exactly. for the risk you take. Yeah. yeah. You, you both mentioned the, the two uh, things, so timing and, and budget and cost, that I think typically give rise to uh, uh, specific issues during the life uh, of the project. So uh, now we will discuss with uh, Luke and uh, Maria Irene the specific issues that um, can come up during the monitoring uh, of the project. And uh, Luke, the question to you, what are the most common issues that you see? I mean, I mentioned uh, timetables, and budgets because they are the, the, the ones that uh, pro, you know give rise to tensions. But uh, we would like to hear from you on your, on the basis of your uh, experience, what are the most common issues that you see? Thank you, Marie. Uh, <clears throat> as we all know, the project needs to be built in time, under budget, and with the quality required by the specifications. Um, I don't know how many engineers we have in the room. But before joining the dark side and going into forensics, I was a construction engineer. I was building power plants uh, in Algeria. So I, I think I'll speak uh, from the heart and from experience and support the engineers a little bit more than maybe some others have done. Um, first, first and foremost, we have to remember that most engineers do not have a legal background. They don't have legal training. They're just focusing on getting things done. They have been trained to lay pipes, to erect seal structures, and to commission um, equipment. Therefore, I, I do echo uh, the opinions of Dan and Francois. Sometimes the contract for them is just a set of advice, recommendations, um, um, wishes that they need to be, to be applied when you're building a project, even though when you end up in a dispute resolution process, this is, this is not the case. Um, therefore, um, first and foremost, when everyone is actually running towards the end, they're running towards completing the project on time. They don't really care. They don't really care about what um, clause 18.3 says about X or Z. Um, and this is where mistakes are made. Practically, the first uh, the first thing that we recommend as experts and as consultants is proper record keeping. Um, again, speaking as an engineer or an ex engineer, if you like. Um, People, they, the, the record keeping, the data, the data keeping of a specific job is the most boring part of an engineer's life. No one wants to be stuck and on an Excel spreadsheet recording hours spent, concrete poured, um, tons of steel, uh, steel erected. No one wants to do that. However, when we end up in a situation of a dispute resolution, these are the numbers that everyone is actually looking for. Um, I have a real 
of any maybe funny uh, example of a project that we were discussing as experts and we, real, we realized that during the summer the efficiency of the contractor had dropped a lot so we were acting for the employer and the employer was asking us why did this happen all the curves were actually suggesting that it ha has happened and we couldn't figure out and then we realized that this period actually coincided with the world cup with football <laughs> so practically the contractors were actually stopping working to watch the matches <clears throat> however since no one was paying attention, no one was actually keeping records contemporaneously, this position was really difficult to prove and to be argued later on, one year later, that actually people stopped working to watch football. But it had happened. So uh, proper record keeping is like a safety net, both for the contractors and for the engineer or the employer, in order to be able to plead any case, positive, negative, defense, attack, etc., etc. This is our number one advice to everyone doing a construction project. Uh, secondly, and we have to remember, um, <laughs> projects are notorious for really, really difficult design. Sometimes the, the, the solutions are innovative, they're new, or the, the, the technology advances literally every six months and everyone tries to catch up. Therefore, a, a proper in, interaction and coordination between the contractor, the engineer and the employer is actually required. And as I think Fersan uh, said, I have never seen also a job where every <laughs> clause of uh, or that had a time bar was actually followed to the letter. It's actually not, not feasible because sometimes things take time. Not, the FIDIC might say that you need to reply on, on X days, however, the, the, the design itself might take longer. So, um, and walking in, especially if you're working under a uh, similar jurisdiction, walking into a project with a good faith, trying to help your colleague actually build a project is really, really essential. Uh, I had another case. Where, whereas um, the, the, the parties fought so hard that the employer practically stopped reviewing the design altogether. And the contractor didn't know what to do. Do we continue the job? Do we try to terminate? Do we, do we claim? Um, because again, the engineers on the end of the day, they want to build things. So they don't want to get down the, uh, the road to, to arbitration dispute resolution. So uh, it was really tough to understand and understand the commercial exposure and the position of what someone should do when you practically break the link with, with, the, with the employer. Um, there was another comment about um, contractual conditions and whether they are applied 100% or not. Again, sometimes engineers, they approach contracts as documents of have advice. Not actually, that they don't really comply them 100%. But also, to be fair, when it comes to technical specifications, imagine a scenario where you have bought a boiler for a power plant, because we're speaking about energy, where 90% of the specifications were actually uh, combined with. And then there was 10% practically the boiler did more or less everything it should have done, but not literally everything, not 100%. It didn't follow the specifications 100%. What do you do then? The employer was arguing that this is not in line with the contract, which is literally true. But on the other hand, the contractor was, was uh, finding that I looked everywhere in the market and your contract actually is not realistic. We cannot supply you with with a boiler that actually does what the contract says and to be fair again wearing my engineer hat on this is something that you cannot predict 100 percent when you're signing the contract because for example you in this particular case you can buy a boiler that works in let's say in the environment in the conditions climate conditions of france but then if you want to set up the same boiler in africa it might not perform the same so no matter no matter how many formulas or scenarios you run they're always some room for difference between the actual equipment and what the contract says. Uh, finally, we discussed about time schedules, budgeting, etc., etc. Another crazy example from real life. Um, I also once participated in uh, um, a tendering process where different contractors were actually tendering to build a power plant. There were four uh, bidders. Three of them proposed a time schedule of 36 to 38 months. Which for a, I don't know, a medium-sized power plant, again from experience, looks reasonable. And then the fourth contra contractor came in and said out loud, 18 months. Everyone in the room literally left. I don't know if you think that you can build a building in Paris in 18 months. Certainly you cannot build a power plant in 18, 18, 18 months. But then again, people stopped laughing because the employer had to award the same project to that particular contractor because of the formula they were using. The formula was actually promoting shorter time schedules. So they had to award the project to this, this very contractor. 
do you think that is there anyone in the room, no matter how how big or small score you have on power plants, thinking that this contractor actually built this, the project in 18 months? No, they did not, and they ended up in a really in, in, a, in a really hard uh, arbitration, trying to to claim everything actually to to, to get more extension of time to be able to to uh, build the project uh, within reason. So sometimes, and this is. Uh, this is partially why we're in business in a way. Um, the, 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 time, the planning is just not realistic. You cannot just build anything under any, any uh, time proposed and, and still believe that it, it, this is feasible. And this is one of the main arguments we as lay experts are making when we're arguing a case, whether we're trying to check whether time schedule was realistic or not. Uh, so um, and that, that, that's my wrapping up point. Uh, my, our recommendation to contractors is that there's a fine line between being commercially aggressive or practically you like and, and actually bidding for something that can be built within within the time restrictions. Um, so yes, uh, here it is. And this is also, also linked with the budgets because then if you're operating in really, really small margins, then you might have COVID or you might have the conflict in Ukraine that's a really hot topic right now. And this actually kills your margins. So, so we have contractors going under threatening to go under or to leave the construction site because uh, they're, they're working uh, on negative uh, cash flows, and this puts more strain to the relationships with, with the employer. Thanks, uh, Luke. Thanks also for sharing, in particular, the real life uh, examples uh, that show the, how tricky things are. And no matter how much you try to anticipate uh, things, you try to be efficient, you try to uh, provide for the right budget or the right timing, there are things that you cannot uh, predict and, and control. Um, my favorite, speaking of delays, mm -hmm. uh, there are obviously a, a number of factors that can uh, cause a delay in a project. Recently, and Luke mentioned uh, COVID-19, the war in Ukraine. Um, what are, in your experience, the most common issues uh, that cause delays in, uh, during the life of, the, of a project? Um, so usually the, the 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 four corners that i that i take when i think about risk of a, of a major construction project sorry disclaimer my company usually builds infrastructure and in terms of uh, energy projects they're mostly hydro power uh, projects so that's what we, we mostly build we don't build nuclear plants but as you might remember Marady, we worked on a massive <laughs> nuclear plants uh, construction arbitration so i remember something <laughs> from there too it was very funny I was in a, in, a, in a country where sauna culture was very important, and we always made the joke that everything was delayed, but the sauna was very on the first side, and they won always. But uh, jokes aside, so for me, the four uh, main factors of, of, uh, of delay and additional cost, because in the end, when there are tensions in the project, what do they cause? A request for extension of time and request for additional cost, so the time and cost in the end. And the equation is complete with four main factors, which is the geological risk, the natural risk, the, the financial risk, and the political risk. That's what I see as construction uh, projects in general. Natural, because I mean, uh, sometimes we work in very difficult geographical areas. Uh, I mean, we have a famous big project, the Jared the Dam in Ethiopia, that was very difficult because it's in a very isolated area with difficult weather conditions and ground conditions. And also sometimes might happen that, uh, as we were discussing, right, like the employer gives you some geologic information, then you go there and it's completely different. Sure. Like, nope. <laughs> and then you have to ask for more money, more time to complete the projects uh, in the, according to the employer requirements. Then you have political risk, you never know when the, especially when you build infrastructure, your client is a ministry most of the time in the state. If the government changes, oh my God, they can create so many issues, so many strains, so many tensions, because the previous government chose you, not the new government. The new government needs to show that, oh my God, not everything that the old government did was wrong. And it's really like you feel that the relation with the employer changes mm -hmm. a lot. Then you have the financial risk, because of course, especially when you go, Build in certain uh, developing countries, you have financial institutions financing most of the project. And, um, you know, in the end, the lenders became like the, the, the third wheel in the relationship. So every time that you try to negotiate an extension of time with your employer, you always have to involve the lenders because they, they manage a drawdown, they manage, they unblock the, the cash, basically, the cash flow. So we have to consider this uh, third, uh, third uh, element in the equation. 
And then uh, something that is for me, uh, of course, like natural risk, but it's very brief and very obvious. If you have, especially now with the climate change, you have natural impact on the work site. Like we build in the, See, we build. Like, <laughs> the name of my we company. Build. <laughs> <laughs> we build in the open air. We build in the in open in open spaces, and we are exposed <clears throat> to all the forces of nature. Uh, exceptional floods, exceptional weather conditions, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, are impacting the world site a lot. So yes, again, delays, more time, more cost, etc. And two more risks that are, I identify as more typical to energy projects, I would say, are the, uh, we discussed that, the technological and the regulatory project. Mm -hmm. Because we're discussing, like, when you build a power plant, it's not like, for example, we build the, 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 the mosque uh, in Abu Dhabi. It was there, when it was finished. Oh, wow. <laughs> it was not. If you build a hydro um, hydroelectric power plant, you need to connect to the grid, you need to comply with much more stringent regulation, et cetera, et cetera. And what if they change during the construction period? It's it's much more complicated. And the technological, as you were saying, the technological risk, of course, <laughs> like you are not just building a normal, a normal isolated building. You have to uh, think about the technology, catch up with them, et cetera, et cetera. The more complex the project, the more the technological risk increases, of course. Um, so that's my big equation and we can be here and, and, and speak forever but uh, I don't want to bother anyone maybe I want to say something about delays um, it's true that as also Francoise was saying the employers must be reasonable I have to say that there's a little bit of a lack of fair play in the in the game sometimes it's true sometimes the contractors underbid and sometimes the employers are too strict and too unreasonable Maybe because, as I was saying, employers are political entities, a political uh, liability and uh, accountability. So I kind of understand, but you cannot be unreasonable. So for example, our showcase project recently that the company built is the Genova Bridge. Might have remembered that three years ago, a, a large the, the main bridge in Genova collapsed, unfortunately killing people, and we rebuilt it in 15 months. So one month in advance. <laughs> I've never seen that before. <laughs> That's probably the only project that I've seen. Yeah. But our people work day and night for 15 months with one day of break during Christmas uh, 2020. <clears throat> so at the same time, the employer was very reasonable and allowing a little bit of additional cost when it's necessary, when in acceleration, etc. Of course, there was COVID in between. So I would say that's more or less my, my, my view on the main risk on the, on the energy project. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for sharing uh, uh, those examples. And it, it, yes, it is, it is a reality that the construction project is a living animal that uh, does not operate in isolation and is affected by all those factors that you, that you both mentioned that can affect it in all sorts of uh, different ways. I think, look, you yes, want to I'll make, I'll make two comments. Uh, first of all, I, I agree with the most examples. <clears throat> because we have to realize that energy projects have lots of interfaces. You have to connect to the grid. You have to you have to connect with with the water network. You have to know where where your wastewater will actually be be extracted to. Um, sometimes you have you have a job where whereas the, the dispute was over who has to look for water in the desert. So someone had to bring water within the, the power plant, and no one no one wanted to take the responsibility to start drilling holes in this hard desert to find water. Um, so these interfaces that also include other stakeholders, like um, the city or, or uh, the government, they need to be taken into consideration and they make the construction projects more difficult to manage rather than a civil engineering project or, or a building, if you like, like, like in Paris. That is one. And secondly, I, I totally agree with Maria Irene on being reasonable when you approach uh, the time schedule, because I, I like your example, because this is the second project I know that finished earlier. I have another project that I was working on that finished earlier but then we had another labor complexity about good faith because the employer went to the contractor and said can you finish earlier and we'll figure this out mm -hmm. and that was a verbal instruction so the contractor finished earlier and then went back to the, the employer to get paid and said you know I never told you things earlier you do this out of the kindness of your heart and then we ended up in a dispute <laughs> so uh, we now have two examples of projects finished things earlier but in, in any case in any case I think employers need, need to be a little bit more sympathetic 
towards these really big projects, really big projects. And also an extra level of scrutiny is required on the planning when you're especially issuing a baseline or you're putting something in writing in your contract. Because again, we've seen people taking really, really close focus and uh, attention to detail when it comes to the first activities that need to be completed, like permitting, civil work, setting up your working site. But then down the line, you see that people are supposed to be doing commissioning in two hours. So they're kind of, of <laughs> compressing the activities that I will, will actually care towards the end of the project to favor the activities that will start first. So in a way, it is required a global review of the program to, to substantiate that it is indeed feasible. And this is the case. It's uh, under ordinary, probably, uh, uh, conditions. What happens when uh, unforeseen events uh, intervene. We we had, we spoke of COVID-19. We spoke of the war in Ukraine. Uh, what are the, uh, the 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 usual conflicts that you see over force majeure clauses in construction projects? Um, force majeure is, is um, another animal within the context. It's, often, it's really really often a point of dispute, especially pre-COVID, mm -hmm. because we had a number of cases. As you might, may imagine that started before COVID and then COVID hit and then this whole discussion about what is force majeure and up to what point COVID is, is actually force majeure because there was another another argument about COVID being force majeure for the first six months of 2020 yeah. and then stop being force majeure because then you're actually working under, under these conditions. Then we uh, have another case where we are trying to figure out how much rain is, is too much because it depends on your practically measuring point. Um, um, climatic change have changed drastically the last 10 years. So if you take an average value of the last 50 years, the number is different compared to taking an average value of the last 10 years. We had winds that stopped cranes, so the, the works practically stopped, but, but uh, winds were considered to be part of the environmental study of the region. So in a way, the contractor was arguing that I cannot really work because there is no crane that can actually operate under these circumstances. And the employer said, yeah, but it's not in the contract, so it's not for sure. <laughs> So we have to be reasonable, I guess, and this is a point a point that I know now uh, both lawyers and also engineers are taking closer attention to when they're signing a new contract or an amendment if you like, but it, it is a, a, a continuous pain that actually um, creates disruption in the relationships of the parties and also disruption uh, when constructing an, an actual project. Yeah, we're, the other day we were discussing about climate change impact on construction projects. And it's true, like the 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 key, the key, well, one of the keys of the problem is the force majeure clause. So people were wondering whether because force majeure right is for an extraordinary event. Mm -hmm. How long can we consider mm -hmm. like a heavy flood as extraordinary? As you know, as much as we advance in this unfortunately difficult world where climate change is a reality, uh, how much extraordinary can it be? And then like a little story on COVID-19, I remember we had a project in, in Europe and end of uh, 2019, we ordered two TBMs from China. So around November, our colleagues like, ha, ah, look at that, what's happening in China? They have all this problem with this virus. I'm sure the TBM will never get stuck there. Imagine what's happening. <laughs> the TBM never arrived in Europe, never. But of course, like the producer of TBM was claiming for its majority to us, and we're trying to explain to the client that we don't have the TBM to start rigging, right? Rigging. And like, well, it's not my problem, get another one. And I mean, of course, it's just a virus over there, what's the point? And then I remember when finally the Organisation um, Mondiale de Santé declared COVID a pandemic. On that point, people started relaxing, relaxing, like relaxing the time frame at least a little bit and saying, okay, that's, that's really impacting all the. All the project, but I see now more and more in the course major close now pandemic, which was not there before. Correct, and on the, on the same the same example, like TBM is a tunnel boring machine. It's a really big thing that actually goes old switch. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for the, the ones that are not familiar with the term, uh, practically we have the same case with Ukraine war. So even though everyone understands that the supply chain has been heavily disrupted, the employer's position is that I don't care. You should find another supplier that is not disrupted. However, uh, specialized machinery like TBMs or boilers, you don't just go to the supermarket and just <laughs> choose another brand. Uh, you need time for manufacturing, time for design, you have to send RFQs, and then you have to wait for people to actually design said, said equipment. It's, it's not as easy as starting knocking on doors everywhere in the world. And, you know, I cannot buy a TBM from China, I'll buy a, a TBM from Brazil. 
and no they, harm, don't, no foul. they don't cost the same. Yes, they don't cost the same. Your delivery times get heavily disrupted. You might you might find another TBM in Brazil that might come to your work site after two years. So the, the, practically the, the, the job the job is, is, is done and you have to have them for a new team. And then again, it, it goes back, back to, to the, the, the letter of, of the contract. Whereas if you put really constraining wording within what for major is, you cannot step out of. But then if you put something really broad, you see contractors claiming about everything. You know, uh, we have seen claims that it, it rained for two hours and then it was mud in the construction site. So we cannot, we want the new of one week. Okay, it's expected that, yeah. that we will have eventually mud in the construction site. So um, yes, um, first concern, you know, closes are really fun. It's just a, sorry, it's just yeah. a little bit. We, we sort of chase our tail as an industry sometimes, don't we? And we, we've I've been asked to draft so many COVID clauses that you now put in, and then people want to take them to the end degree as well. It's COVID plus any variation, mm. plus any mutation. <laughs> <Exactly. any, laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, and then you've got your Ukraine clauses mm. now in the, in the contracts. And it, you can understand the need for to legislate for them specifically because arguably they're not force majeure now because you, you should know about them and should, you should allow for them but it is it is very interesting that in, and you think about the weather examples that are given there i mean some of the standard forms that we use NEC, for example it's, it's specifically said that, uh, specifically try and say that whether it's a one in ten year event and you have a point for measuring it that's selected by the parties in advance. But but you're right, I mean one in ten year event is, is it going to be a one in five year event? Is it going to be an annual event? And I think it really you have to think through the potential impacts on the particular project because I actually don't think there's a one size fits all example here. I mean if you're doing a interiors fit out project in the construction sense, weather's not going to be a big issue to you. If you're doing a big energy project where actually it might it might be too hot and you don't usually legislate for these sorts of things so i think you just have to give a bit of thought to your particular circumstances to me the fact that the pandemic for example will not be mentioned in the force majeure clause does not really bother me because it was so impossible to foresee that people didn't even put it in the clause because nobody would have time so for me, it's the best example of a true force majeure event. Because a force majeure event normally is something you can't predict. You don't know it's going to happen, right? And you can't control, etc. cetera, the, the conditions. But if nobody ever thought about it being an event, well, of course it's a force majeure, right? If it has consequences. It, I think it depends on the, on the scale. Because at the beginning, my example with the TBM, no, no, at the beginning, the employer was like, yeah, okay, a couple of people with a grip in China cannot stop the project. Like, not a couple of people with a grip. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, no, definitely. But then you also see the, the other side where, I mean, we, we've seen <clears throat> acting for contractors, subcontractors writing at the outset saying, oh, we're going to be delayed. We, we can't get materials. It's a COVID issue, force majeure. <laughs> and then two months later, you get a separate saying, oh, by the way, we turned up at the site and you weren't ready for us. So actually, it's prevention, it's not force majeure. <laughs> And it's, I mean, we, we've seen all the things rather than this because of COVID. I don't think any of us expected really to have to run and deal with in our careers. Yeah, but I, I also think that equipment and materials in general uh, can, whether affected by COVID and force majeure events or by other circumstances, can also be problematic in monitoring and, and uh, uh, running through a project to meet your deadlines. Uh, have you? Uh, Maria Irene, what is your experience with um, equipment failure from, you know, whether in terms of qualities or quantities and how they are delivered on site, uh, how, this, how does these issues affect uh, yeah. delays? Well, the TBM is one of the most uh, like clear mm -hmm. examples for me, but it's not only that. Sometimes you have, you have another um, water treatment plant that we were uh, testing, commissioning, and at some point one of the turbines broke down. <laughs> and again, it's not that you can go to the supermarket and get another yeah. one. Uh, you have to, like, it's a trade off. You have to decide shall I take one that is cheaper and it's going to take me longer to get here, so the employer is going to give me penalty for delay, or shall I pay more for something mm -hmm. I can get here next week, but then will the employer remove the additional cost? 
it's always a, a bit complicated and it happens all the time because as Luke was saying a construction project especially when they involve energy requires highly technological equipment that you don't find readily available and most of the time they're tailored um, for sure sometimes like sometimes also information are, are given wrong as I was saying before it happened again sorry to be honest Jean, <laughs> like the, the client told the floor told us oh yes you have to dig here dig there and then here you have to do the tunnel and the pressure is x depending on the pressure of a certain lot of uh, where you have to, 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 to create a tunnel basically you buy different tbms mm -hmm. like they're diff almost different machines so we ordered a certain tbm for that level of pressure when we started digging and we started really seeing the pressure the pressure was like twofold we we're like we cannot use the tbm you told us we could use now we have to buy another one order another one etc etc now of course we're fighting who's fault to set and going back to the contract maybe sometimes it's very important especially for the geological risk i would say an information given very important to allocate the risk of uh, the geological information we had experience of some contracts and it was very bad where and i have no idea where the contract was signed back in the days but basically the contract said the employer will give you geological information but if they're wrong no responsibility all your all your problem no responsibility and it, it's a diff, very difficult clause then to manage because as we were saying this four risk always happen always always never project and then when you realize that your geological information were wrong Who's gonna pay for the extra time and extra money that this this difference uh, happens? And then of course, like speaking about materials, as you asked, the war in Ukraine made materials more pricey in most of the markets, and or it made them unavailable on the Ukrainian market. So of course you have to look in other markets. But as we're saying, when you look in a rush, you have to face the trade-off of either paying more to get them on time or paying less. But have to ask for extension mm. of time, which is penalties, which is money in the end. So it's, it's a little bit of the, the same circle. And workforce is the same. Like we had many Ukrainian workers in a certain area of Eastern Europe that, for obvious reason, could not come to the site anymore. And we had to look in other countries where the market is different. And yeah, who's going to pay for that? Yes. <laughs> yes. Speaking, speaking about the uh, Sorry, there's a question. Just yeah, one quick question on the geological risk. Um, what is your preferred contractual mechanism to anticipate uh, the geological risk? I know on a lot of international projects, more and more the use of a GBR, a geological baseline report, is used. Is that something contractors are happy to work with, or are there alternatives? Uh, to be very honest, Philip, I've never seen it before, <laughs> but uh, I think. The problem is very basic. When you negotiate with the employer, there is this fairy tale that contractors can negotiate the contract. You rarely negotiate the contract. The employer puts the tender documents on the table and says, it is what it is, sign it or leave it. So that's unfortunately what I think happened in that contract that was very complicated and very heavy on the contractor. I think you can try as much as you can to negotiate this clause, at least to avoid contract as the one I was mentioning, where you say, do you like this information? Even if they're wrong, it's your problem contractor, you pay for that. You can try to avoid that, to nuance it a little bit, but if there is no space for negotiation, in the end, it's a, it's a take or leave it. It's the company who decides whether to take the risk or not, knowing what, hopefully knowing what they're signing. Uh, Marie, going back to equipment failure, there's another layer of complexity. We have a case where uh, my, my favorite topic is turbines. So we have, <laughs> we have another case where the turbine was actually dropped off the track that was actually transferring it to the site. So if you're familiar, the turbines have fins and these fins were bent. So then there's the question, how do we resolve this? The contractor wanted to, to, to do something on site, i.e. cut the fins, fix the fins and then load them back onto the turbine whilst the employer wanted to be on the safe side and ship the turbine back to france to be properly fixed and then get gets it back on, on the construction site but this would have an impact of eight months so the question is okay if this is the case which solution do we choose and who will actually pay for this for this delay which is the proper solution as you understand both parties have experts technical experts at least on the field recommending one solution over the other and vice versa and the negotiations only lasted three months before they could actually make a decision on what to do with this, this turbine. And 
since I, I, I'm not studying like the turbine topics. Another 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 example on turbines is that another turbine that was actually about to reach the construction site, but it couldn't cross a bridge. The bridge was I don't know 200 meters away from the construction site and was not able to carry the load. So there was a discussion how we will actually support the bridge, who's going to pay for that, whether that could have been have been prevented, whether it's another route, etc. etc. So um, not only equipment failure but also transportation can actually go wrong when we are speaking about uh, energy production. And uh, to finish off this, uh, you know, this discussion about the, the, the life, the monitoring of the, of the project and the issues that can, uh, uh, can arise, uh, we've mentioned a few times the war in Ukraine. Now, this has given rise to the many issues that you, uh, that you mentioned, but also to the rise in energy uh, costs and energy prices, net zero commitments. How do you see that uh, affecting in practice uh, energy construction projects? I have a case where practically the contractor is trying to renegotiate the, the contract on this basis and approach them again. They try to sit on the same table with, with the employer and say, look what's going on. We need, we need to address this because, again, we're discussing really small margins. If you cannot really pay, if you cannot finance your own project, there's no, no way that that will actually go well. Uh, plus, but on the, on the other side, again, when we're speaking about energy projects, we have to remember that this is a highly political issue, as Maria Rin said. Because governments or whoever the employer is needs the energy for said country, so they're not really willing to negotiate or give extensions of time because they have to answer questions on, on their side on why an energy project is getting delayed. So we had another another uh, client that wanted more energy before summer because they were expecting that during summer everyone will actually turn on their air conditioning, especially with with climate change. So they couldn't really they couldn't really afford giving more time to the contractor to actually do the project. So this puts extra pressure on, and that compounds with all the other uh, issues that we discussed, on, on the contractors to finish, to finish in time. But then you can only do as much because, of course, mm -hmm. because of the problems we have been discussing. Yeah, right. It's like when you, have, I mean, when you build a project, a major infrastructure <clears throat> project, you need energy. It's not like a lot of energy. It's not like a plug. And yeah, with the rising prices of energy, everything is difficult. And again. As you were mentioning, the margin got to get eroded very, very quickly. And who's going to pay for that again? Mm -hmm. So sometimes we call for the government's help, you know, mm -hmm. to secure some supply at a uh, controlled price, but it doesn't work all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I definitely think over the last sort of year, maybe we've, we've I, you, you, we had this whole period of years where fluctuation causes were invariably drafted out of contracts. Some of these sand forms even dropping, and now you've got them back in <laughs> and back in a big way. But I mean, the, what you write in the contracts, in my recent experience, can be completely different to what you have to do on site anyway, commercially. And sometimes, having said, do not uh, ignore the contract. Sometimes you do. Um, I, I know I've, I've seen examples where where the materials crisis was really hitting and main contractors would speak to subcontractors and say, right, we we need this aluminium or whatever it is. And but what's what's the price? And the subcontractor will say, right, this is the price, but I will only be able to keep it for you for a, for a week. So it's either take it or leave it. And the contractor literally goes back 24 hours later and the subcontractor will be, well, that was the price yesterday. It's now X. Mm -hmm. And despite you trying to say, well, we can't pay that, we can't, you're, you're obliged to give it to us anyway most of the time as well do you want it or not because i can make a lot more money putting this elsewhere and worry about the consequences later so it's it's, it's a real sort of sort of model and storm of commercial issues combined with legal issues at the moment yeah and uh it sounds like um there are so many elements so many facets of a project that can be impacted in so many different ways and we haven't even touched upon that sometimes the relationship between employer and contractor that can also add to the complications of monitoring the project. But um, we are here also to discuss about dispute uh, resolution. Um, so all four of you have extensive experience in, in the actual resolution of disputes arising out of construction projects, not only advising and the setting up and the and the running and monitoring the project. So I would like to hear to, to uh, hear from you about how you go, Maria and maybe you can start first as you are, you know, you are uh, working with this, uh, with we build a major uh, contractor. Uh, what are the elements that you typically would take into considerations about 
resolving uh, conflict uh, efficiently. Um, so as we discussed previously, what I learned going in-house is that for as much as I uh, like litigation and uh, arbitration and anything that goes with it, for the company it's a big nuisance mm -hmm. because litigation represents uncertainty and represents a risk. For the company it's difficult to budget a risk, uh, well, actually to, to factor a risk that is something unknown into their budget. Mm -hmm. They need certainty, numbers, quantum, etc. So if we can avoid a dispute actually, for me because that's so much fun. If we can avoid a dispute, the company is much happier. And that's why we're working recently on strategies to try to, I don't want to say avoid because we're saying there's so many risks that it happens at some point, but at least reduce the amount of claims as much as possible. I honestly find the, the multi-chair clause proposed by the FIDI contracts quite effective. It is true that the employer's representative, of course, being paid by the employer by nature is I mean, I can't deny that most of the time it's within their rights. But if the employer is presented to himself, recognize that there is something to be paid to the contractor, at that point, the, the cash flows. So if you manage to convince the employer's representative, and sometimes, you, I know, very rarely, but sometimes you do, at that point, usually you finally make a point, you get the extra money you need, and then you go on. And then, you know, there's a pulling off period most of the time in multi tier clauses. And it's, it's funny, I thought it was just a, a stereotype, but it's true. If you're not pushed to negotiate, mediate, call it as you want, it's difficult that someone, how can I say, um, ask it for first. Mm -hmm. No one wants to be the, especially, I don't know, maybe it's a matter of culture, of ego, of Italians, I don't know, <laughs> but no one wants to be the first to ask, hey, why don't we stop here one second and yeah. try to negotiate? Yes. But if it's in the clause then it's mandatory and it's in a, a, a procedure um, conditions, you have to do it. And at that point, maybe something good happens. And of course, I personally find DAB, when they're used properly as the Anglo-Saxon way is, useful to reduce at least the claims that goes to arbitration. Uh, they're used as unfortunately Europeans and uh, South Americans do, they're absolutely useless because it's a pre-arbitration, doubles the cost, yeah. and then you go in any case for arbitration, so what's the point? So we have two major projects where parties are fighting like hell, the only thing they agreed on is to skip the AB, which means that they didn't understand <laughs> anything, anything about the mechanism. So that's it. However, if this is unavoidable, as because you cannot just make this triangle by the employer. Uh, we still find that arbitration is the best for two main reasons, and then I, I finish. A, because it's a neutral forum, and if you, your client is a ministry of a certain country, yeah. and you have to go litigate against the ministry in front of the courts of the state of the ministry, that, yeah, that, 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 that's biased, that's absolutely biased. And also, the you can choose your, your arbitrators who has knowledge and understands the, the industry and all the risks that we have just discussed right now. So when you talk about critical path, the guy understands what you're talking about. So yeah. These are the two reasons why arbitration is still a valuable um, option. Okay, thank you. And what about um, adjudication? I wanted to ask uh, Francoise and, uh, and Dan, they're both experienced in uh, adjudication proceedings. Do you think that there are specific issues arising out of you know, uh, construction disputes that are best resolved through uh, adjudication? Well, I still see, as far as Europe is concerned, and the true meaning of Europe today, I'm not <laughs> meaning of before, um, that there is still a reluctance to use the AB, um, just because, just because, I don't know why. <laughs> and I feel often that it's a question of how could they do any better than we cannot manage to do through negotiations. Um, I, I've, that, that's what I really saw for years <coughs> as a council is that, sorry to say in front of this audience, but mostly men in charge of this project would consider that if they could not manage it through direct negotiation with their counterpart, nobody else could do a useful job in any setting. Maybe so, but maybe not, huh? let's face it. 
and uh, I don't think it's uh, used enough. Uh, if it's used, it's not um, used when it should be and at the intensity or the rhythm that would make it really productive and have the effect of reducing the amount of issues that come up potentially at the end. And yesterday I was at another one of these, uh, you know, events and um, the, the, the English speaker, which surprised me quite a lot, really led a charge against the Navy, saying that for him uh, it was totally useless because you had three guys who knew much about nothing, um, they were underpaid and they were just rendering stuff, he didn't even want to qualify that as decision, that in any event were ill-informed, not uh, well explained, not reasoned, and it was just a way to spend uh, money before going to arbitration. And I was quite surprised by the way, because I, I, I thought I was listening to a continental European, right, and not to <laughs> somebody who lives in a country where I thought it worked. So. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> um, so I, I probably comment on what I do comment this from a slightly different um, direction because uh, I've I've had I mean uh, the DABs I think really depend on how it's structured and how it's set up and how it's used. But for us, I mean in the UK, <coughs> adjudication has really become the the go-to for resolution of construction disputes. So much so that and apologies to those in the uh, the audience, but we've almost build domestic arbitration unless there's a real privacy aspect I mean, you were talking of certain issues we yeah. we tend to as a tcc have specialist construction judges that come from a construction law background um and despite them being slow really not that much slower than some of the arbitration um panels and obviously you don't pay for the uh, for the judges in the same way that you pay for the um for the arbitrators and um, but so adjudications, I've, I've done really hundreds, and I, I actually flip. I think sometimes there are some real, there are some real good things about adjudication. You get on, you resolve a dispute, I and mean, it's meant to be within 28 days, but invariably it's it's two or three months. Um, but you get a decision that is temporarily binding on the parties. So yes, it might be all encompassing, and for a lawyer, it's great to get the adrenaline flowing for a week while it's on your side, and then you get a bit of a break. I have no idea how it's dealt with on the project when we're taking all of these key people away for weeks at end to, uh, to put witness statements and et cetera together. But it, you, you get decisions that, I mean, it, it's known to be rough justice. So you get decisions that you, you generally live with and invariably both parties end up feeling a little bit sore from them, which I think is usually a good sign of, <laughs> of a good decision. Don't be fair. Um, but equally, you do get certain people and i won't go into names but you get people imposing <laughs> cases by right. certain panels and you know before you start that it's going to be something that's friendly it's going to be contractor friendly it's going to be employer friendly and you also get egos our lawyers will generally mm -hmm. egos, but sometimes you get a quantity surveyor deciding the point of law and deciding that the english court of is wrong and that's a real life experience that i've had and there's nothing that you can really do with it mm. in the interim. And trying to tell your clients, well, how did we lose that? You, you told me we wouldn't, and saying we shouldn't. <laughs> um, well, what we can, what can we do? Well, we can go off to the TCC and we can argue about this for a couple of years. Well, we're not to give a different solution. Mm. So, it, it, so I think th there are a lot of good things about adjudication. Um, there are some things that I still think that need to be ironed out, and and we tend as an industry to throw more and more adjudication as well. So to start with adjudication was really created for a cash flow purpose. <coughs> Have an argue, quick argument about interim applications, notices, etc. Now we ask adjudicators to deal with massive um, professional negligence disputes and, and huge final account disputes, mm. which in the greatest will in the world, you're not going to do within 28 days, three months, even six months. Yeah. And do you think that it is a, a cultural um, thing between the you know the common law and civil law uh, jurisdictions and traditions or is it just the, that the common law and the UK has managed to put in place an efficient adjudication you know uh, system that, that works? Well I think part of it is it's 
imposed on us in terms mm -hmm. of construction disputes and um, as mandated by yeah. law statute that anyone can refer a dispute to adjudication so we've sort of had our hand forced for the last yeah. almost 30 years um which I, and I think people now see it for, for what it is it's, it's rough justice but but they do embrace it mm -hmm. they're willing to embrace mm -hmm. that and I don't know if that's that, if, if that, is that well, I, was, I mean, it has changed the industry, hasn't it? Because um, I was talking to somebody before. I mean, in days gone by, the courts um, were clogged up in the UK with construction disputes, and there were endless arbitrations as well. And that just tied up cash yeah. and time and money. And uh, I think most people who've been in the industry to see the sort of transition, and they're all quite old now, because as Dan said, it's sort of 30 years. It's genuinely transformed the industry, I think. And it's not just, I mean, it's also the threat of this adjudication, which changes the culture. Yeah. So if you know that, how quickly things can escalate and be determined and be temporarily binding, you're gonna act in a different way when you're negotiating commercially. So, I think, you know, in, in, in not just in the UK, every jurisdiction, I think it's been attempted, which are generally common law jurisdictions. I think people have found it a success. They've all implemented it in different ways. I mean, in Australia, I think the only club applies to payment disputes, um, whereas you, the UK went all in on everything. But it's, you know, it, I think it can be transformative. If, if I may, uh, whether it is required by law, or by contract, it's still mandatory. And it, I think it is a, a cultural question of why the parties choose not to go beyond that in the UK versus, versus mm -hmm. uh, continental systems. Is it that statistically you will, uh, courts tend to uphold what uh, adjudicators have uh, decided or because otherwise our experience in Romania, at least what I know that it's a similar experience throughout <laughs> Europe, is that the parties will try to push this up to the utmost, uh, the ultimate limit? Yeah. So it, it, in the UK, uh, I would say somewhere like 98% of adjudications are enforced by the courts. So if you if you try not to pay an award made by an adjudicator, you have to have a really good reason. And then there's a separate question about how many then go on to the next stage and have a full substantive rehearing, if you like. And that I think is is really small. And part of it is that people get the blood and nose through going through adjudication and they just decide we're going to live with it. We're not going to throw more money after more money. And I mean, David referenced sort of a different approach and a, and a different mindset that adjudication brings with it. And I mean, adjudication is meant for cash flow. Equally, equally, you have these big arguments, you have to give the money over to a party. You don't know if that money is going to be there in two years time when they get to a, a full court hearing and full court trial so again that's a bit of a mindset change as well so it's interesting the focus on uh, enforcing the cash flow and the enforceability of the dab that changes the party's subjective position yeah. towards um pushing for a full review or not yeah i sorry yeah i have a question can i what do you think Apart what you said, could convince parties not to rehear, as you said, the whole case? Because something I heard recently is, what if the DAB, especially when there are three, it's one lawyer and two engineers? And I'm giving you an example. We had a very bad experience with one DAB where <laughs> the DAB, sorry, not the case in general. The DAB said, I mean, constructor is 100% right. Here is your 300 million they paid. And then the lawyer started the arbitration and the arbitrator said, you know, you're right on the facts, absolutely. But it was already 28 days, it's worth 29. So claims were time barred, give the money back. <laughs> you can't imagine how painful it was. Anyhow, if in the DAB there would have been a lawyer, do you think it would have changed? And do you think it could be something useful to convince people not to go all the way to arbitration for every DAB? Mark. <laughs> yeah, and it's a very interesting question. For, I mean, applying it to adjudication, we tend to have in our contracts that we have nominating bodies. So almost always you refer to 
TEXA, um, Technology Solicitors yep. Association, Tech Bar, the Barristers equivalent, um, or you go to Rick's Royal Institute of and Chartered Surveyors or, or, or someone specialised in that, and they, these panels can literally throw up anyone. But obviously, and it comes back to the negotiating point, you get an adjudication, you get a contract passed across to you with one person named as the adjudicator. As lawyers, we instantly think, well, there must be a reason for that. There's going to be, yeah, they, they must know each other. They, we're, we're not going to live with that. So we try and argue it out. I think sometimes it is a bit of the, the better the devil you know, um, rather than, as I say, you can have a, a complex legal case decided by a, by a surveyor. So I think if you, if you try to at least make sure that specific disputes are heard by <coughs> relevant disciplines, mm -hmm. and I think the lawyer aspect could go a long way to say, you've got a real risk of spending a lot more money at arbitration and getting the same result. Well, I, I have set aside several uh, DAB decisions because the, the, the experts there had really totally ignored the basic rules of due process. Mm -hmm. Due and process, it's not the contract, due process. Yeah, due process, okay. but due process, you know, <laughs> 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 as well. <laughs> and, um, and, and it was really flabbergasting. And I was thinking, well, yeah, I don't know whether it's good or not on the merits, but that's not the way you do it. And again, it's a question of choice of and the quality of the person who's going to intervene. And for me, it's not a problem if you have a surveyor, but at least they should learn a bit about how you render justice, because that's what they do. Right? They render justice. So if out of three, one was a lawyer, do you think if it was a three people or maybe that? Hopefully that would improve that situation and that would not, uh, that would eliminate probably mm -hmm. this due process uh, risk that we've seen quite often in uh, decisions rendered. I think you still end up with, I mean, all disputes by the time you get to court, you've got both parties who are convinced they're correct, mm -hmm. two lawyers who come at it from a completely different direction, so there's no, and, and invariably a third person who will decide it differently to both of you, mm -hmm. but there's only one thing you can almost always guarantee, and it's that you're both wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not sure you could ever take away that, and I think it really is always going to come down to how much is involved, and mm -hmm. are you, are the other parties properly as well? risks are here because I don't think you can, you can never guarantee a different decision if you go elsewhere. However, at least in Continental Europe there is a learning curve yeah. uh, because, uh, for, for example, I had, I had a case where the contractor was trying to be reasonable. Still, they thought that if we lose, it will go to arbitration, so no harm, no foul. And then the employer came in and tried to overturn the extension of time provided by their own engineer. Yeah. So I said, okay, this is work. We're going to, we're going to be arguing the, the worst case uh, scenario for our, our side to try to, to mitigate the situation. Or another case, going back to what Francois says, um, I was appointed for a dispute board and we were arguing with, with the clients, the clients, on, on the mix of, of specialties within the dispute board. And the clients, because this was a power plant and the dispute was over commissioning, they only wanted engineers to be sitting in the dispute board. So we actually were advising them against it. Uh, because of, of, of the reasons I've just explained. So again, it, it depends. It depends on the actual parties uh, that are being involved. And uh, what what do you think? Uh, I'll start with Dan and Francois about mediation as a you know another means of resolving disputes, especially construction disputes. I think there is not enough use of that tool. Mm -hmm. um, first, the negotiations that are held are as far as I've been able to witness, always held on the basis of positions. So they negotiate on positions. They never implement reasoned negotiation. I mean, it's not rocket science. It's been taught in Harvard for mm -hmm. many years now, but it has not percolated down at all <coughs> to the way that people on the ground do negotiate. And it's the same for mediation. Um, First, it is often seen as a sign of weakness that you decide to implement the mediation. Um, mediate, I mean, that's what women do when they go and crochet together somewhere. Um, <laughs> not what we are men do when we work on the power plant. Um, and there's also a total misperception as to what mediation is and how it works. Uh, at least not evaluative mediation, but facilitative mediation, it's, it's, <coughs> it does function in another way. And if 
you haven't been <coughs> trained to do it, and if you haven't learned to do it, you can't even imagine how it's going to work. But I feel very often a reluctance <laughs> going into it. Um, and uh, when they have to, because it's imposed by the, the clause, it's going to be like, uh, well, okay, we're going to have one or two meetings, and then uh, I suppose one or two meetings is enough for the good faith behavior, and then we can just uh, say that it's over and get to real business uh, of dispute. And I think it's a real missed opportunity. Um, when you discuss and when you see the, the level of success of mediation globally, I'm not saying in energy construction disputes, but globally, it's around 75 to 80%. So why wouldn't you spend several days trying to mediate a dispute that's going to cost, I think, a bit more if you go full blown into a dispute, even if you only manage to mediate on some point. Of course, it's ideal if you manage to evacuate the whole dispute, but you can still, again, reduce the amount of stuff that would go to litigation or arbitration at the end. So I don't think that we are using, as a you know, sector generally, all the tools that we have in our toolbox. Mm -hmm. um, there tends to be a, a sort of stuck in the rut attitude, right? Um, we, we have one way of doing it and we're not going to try anything else around when it could be cheaper and potentially uh, productive to do it. So we need to widen our horizons. One question on this point. Uh, do people, I have, I have not seen any mediation uh, in my professional career, but do people use experts during mediation? Because the question is, if the same people are negotiating the position and have already disagreed in order to end up in mediation, would that actually work if the same people step into the same room saying the same thing? The no, interior? because you're not going to say the same thing. That's the whole yeah. issue. <laughs> because you approach it totally differently. What is because it? you don't negotiate, you don't mediate on position. Uh, it's the same when, when you have a dispute and you have party appointed experts. The question is to what extent do you seek common ground and when you go before the tribunal or try to defend that party's position? I think it's a, although the setting is different, the mind the approach to the subjective approach to the whole process should be similar. Yeah, I think it's, I, I mean, I, I'm a big fan of mediation, but if it's done properly, and that sort of discussion there is really where you see it's not done properly, we tend to waste so much time as lawyers <laughs> putting position papers together that mm -hmm. tell the party nothing actually about what you really feel about the case. You just put your strongest position forward, even though it's all without prejudice. Then, once the parties read that, you invariably go into a plenary session at the start of the mediation and you tell them why their position paper is wrong. You don't show any signs of weakness. You, know, mm. you, you just can't do that. And then you spend hours with a mediator going back and forward between the rooms until you get to about seven o'clock at night and suddenly someone makes an offer. And you go from naught to sort of 60 in literally a couple of meetings. And I think if, you, if the parties were willing to embrace it properly, realise that you're in a you're there to get a resolution. Neither of you are going to get 100%. Neither of you are going to be completely happy with this. But it's about saving a lot of pain, money, time and effort going forwards. And it's a real opportunity for you to reach something that, as I say, neither of you are going to be completely happy with, but both of you can live with. And that, I think, is a real opportunity. Now, you mentioned facilitative mediation. And I think if you get a good facilitative mediator, this happens a lot earlier in the process and they're, they're, they're worth their weight in gold. I'm not as much fan as of evaluative mediation mm. because I think parties tend to, you get an opinion and it can really entrench the parties in their positions. And I've had examples where we were quite confident about our position. The evaluative mediator gave an opinion and, and was 100%, probably more bullish than we were about it. And the other party was like, well, I've read it, but it's wrong. <laughs> and then my client's like, well, I'm not going to offer anything, am I? Because actually I've got something that's telling me mm -hmm. something completely yeah. different. And then on that one, we actually did go to a um, preliminary issue here and, and the judge thought it was completely different to what I thought it to, was, to what our counsel had thought it was, to what the mediator, the evaluative mediator had decided. I mean, we, they still divide, decided in our favour, but we had a point that we thought we couldn't lose and, and we lost it. <laughs> and then found in our favour on a completely different point. So. Well, that's exactly then why, as a mediator, I don't want position papers. Mm. 
to start because it adds absolutely nothing to the mediation and uh, to the contrary it entrenches people in the position that they've already been bashing each other's head about yeah. for the previous six months so but so much better than act as well. yeah i was going to say a lot of people spend a lot of time drafting a position paper to more to impress their client yeah. rather than actually yeah. to have any yeah effect. but you don't need to exchange it <laughs> no, no, you exactly. send it to the client and everybody's happy yeah no <laughs> precisely and i think you know they're just rather boring aren't they because they just set out everything you know about the position and a valuative mediation i think is a rather defensive way to approach it because it's you're not going all in to negotiate if you want some evaluative element it's sort of it's yeah, a bit cowardly in a way it, it's a completely one. different approach to I, I witnessed um, a u.s mediation in a u.s proceeding where the judge sitting on the bench acted as mediator as well and he went from <coughs> one room to the other room and persuaded each party of the witness <coughs> in that case as it would uh, be decided by that judge so i guess that was one way around the perks of having a, a one person evaluating the mediation and one uh, deciding the case. On the other hand, it feels a bit strange from the perspective of um, due process, for instance, and anticipating the outcome of the decision and so on. No, that's one of the usual ways that retired judges make money in the US. <laughs> <that's what. laughs> I mean, you do got a real life example of something quite similar in Thai mediation with adjudication. We, um, I remember on one adjudication we had the, the adjudicator asked for a, for a meeting in person, which are, are quite rare in um, UK construction uh, adjudications. And um, one of our senior associates was leading this this meeting, and they got to the to the offices, and the media and the the adjudicator stepped in and said, "Okay, well, look, actually, while we're here, I don't really want to discuss too much about the case. I'd rather sort of use it as an opportunity to try and settle." And that due process sort of issue comes up straight away. Like, well, I'm not comfortable with someone who's going to decide this case, listening about what we actually think about our strengths and weaknesses. It just doesn't work. Yeah, and I think there's a lot of uh, a lot to be said about the mindset. And you made the point initially, the mindset about who goes first, who yeah. initiates a discussion, how much do you want to concede? And it's the you know the dispute by itself. It's it's a very difficult. Um, uh, thing to overcome and go into a more conciliatory uh, approach, which may be the, the the reason behind the you know resistance uh, to some extent on um, uh, about mediation. But I, I think like I have a few colleagues, uh, extremely smart engineers who don't have an ego, and I really admire them. So we're having this experience where in Poland, all of a sudden in the past year and a half, the public employers are much more open to mediation mm. so we had like six or seven recently and had very different experiences no position papers mm -hmm. which i think is good you know what's the data that we basically the engineers always look at what do they put in the budget that's the point mm, yeah. so they say okay we have this claim we ask for 20 in the budget we put x if we manage to get to that x yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all like well, yeah, budget kind of, pragmatic. Uh, exactly, very pragmatic approach. One mediation really failed, but because there was a a point of law about a set off that would have costed us hundreds of millions of dollars, and the client really didn't get it. We tried. We explained. We even asked, "Can we have our Italian lawyer talk to your Italian lawyer alone? Maybe they can talk to each other." And so nothing. You know, when there is really like. A, a, Full disagreement on a point of law that that, that that crumble at even that. But if it's about numbers, yeah, yes. yeah, I have to say when you don't have an ego, when you look at the numbers, it can work very well. And you have a good mediator, of course. <laughs> then it works well. I think we're. Uh, can I add a fun, just a yes. fun fact? Uh, this goes back to what you said, Luke, about. Uh, Do you is, can everybody hear, or shall we uh, give microphones? Oh, uh, I'll speak. I'll speak loudly. Okay. You can hear. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Um, just what you said about engineers wanting to get on with the job. Um, I have a very close friend who is pitching for a Singapore bridge project. He's quite high up. He said, honestly, the only thing that seems to be taking up all the email chat with my directors now is whether to put a red or a white bird on the proposal. <laughs> Nobody's even like, you know, uh, really like they're, they're spending hours deciding this, but almost nothing on the actual contract. To be, to be fair, uh, so it's funny. Have, I thought it's. You have to realize that uh, when you are bidding for a project, uh, a project, 
you might get rejected from technicality. So you might just forget to put the CV of the CEO within your dossier, you might get rejected altogether. So if, if the bird needs to be red or black or blue, this is maybe more important then than, than it is now. But again, we, we've seen, we've, I've seen when I was looking for projects back, back in the day, uh, you, you work six, seven, eight months on, on, on a bid, you're technically uh, savvy, you, you have put your numbers in and everything, and then it says, okay, but you don't have, you don't have uh, this document from the local authorities saying that you have established this X company in, in, in that country, or you had to use a font that is number 10 and is number 12, so you get rejected. Because again, it was it was part part of of, of, uh, of the um, original bid and the, the rules that you need to, to apply. So yes, I, I, I understand your 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 friends. Uh, well, I think it's their own logo. They didn't know which one to choose. <laughs> That's not right. <laughs> Uh, now we uh, we should uh, leave some time for Q and A. Before we do that, uh, just one one last question uh, to look. You are the uh, the only engineer in the panel, uh, the one acting as expert. Uh, we would like to hear from you as to what do you think in in managing disputes and in resolving disputes. Are there any elements that you've seen in your experience as acting as experts that could work uh, or do work? Uh, do work. I, I can actually highlight some things that do, that do not work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, first of all, is global claims. Even though you may be familiar with what the ACL protocol says, actual advice against global claims. In continental Europe, people think that if you put one problem on top of the other, you will make a cake of problems, and then you say, okay, then I need 500 days of extension of time <laughs> and costs. We are trying to, to convince them, again, there's a learning curve, trying to convince the clients that these claims do not really work. You're actually blurring the image, and then an arbitrator, an arbitrator comes in and says, you know what, this does not make sense. So I will reserve my judgment. We've seen a decision saying that I understand you have a point, but you have not really proven this, so I cannot give you anything. Mm -hmm. um, so global claims, or again, uh, absence of methodology, because again, law, um, engineers, they do not have a legal background, so sometimes they would just add numbers and say 10 plus 10 plus 10 equals X, so I am want this EOT. Or sometimes they let, okay, I uh, hope no one takes, takes offense on this, uh, they let the, the lawyers actually plead the case altogether. So you, you, read, you read the uh, statement and there is no technical background on, okay, why all these things happen. For example, when you, especially when you're approaching concepts like COVID or disruption in, in, in the brain war, etc. I've seen this happen mostly in continental Europe. The approach is, is, is very, very different. And then there's the design. Again, going back to the comment about energy disputes have really, really complex design. And people feel really strong when someone has spent three years of his life designing a turbine. He really thinks he's correct, 300%. So his ego will not let him concede any point. So they would rather go to a dispute board, they would rather go to arbitration. However, we had a case uh, last year when the dispute was over whether the employer had actually supplied the contractor with enough input to practically build what he was supposed to be building. So of course, two, two professors from the university, 70 plus, they came in, men by the way, uh, they came in and said, one argued that they, 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 the input was enough, and the other argued that the input was not enough. And then I, I don't really know how, how the, the panel would actually approach such, such a point, because it's, it's really, really difficult technically. <coughs> Again, both parties will actually argue their side. So when we're dealing with uh, design issues, I'm, I'm advising my clients that things are not as clear cut as they think they are. They think that they are correct, so they're going into having a really aggressive approach. And again, since they are, the, the time steps are really tight, the, the money is tight, the margins are tight, when people approach the speed resolution, they say that, okay, we're going to go in really aggressively and try to get everything the other side does. And this actually creates lots of problems. Thank you. Thank you, Luke. Anything else that uh, you would like to add before we uh, take questions? Well, just maybe one suggestion. One of the things that I have been advocating and not very often getting um, is that parties consider that dispute is normal in a project, right? You put hundreds of people working together for a long time. How do you think they're going to get on on every point every day all the time? I mean, even in couples, people bicker. So, uh, so you have to consider dispute as normal. And therefore, you should implement a structure which deals with that immediately, not only the day, the day the AB, but also, I, I really think you should front load the arbitration process. 
And why don't you have in this big project a standing arbitration panel constituted at the beginning who knows the contract, has committed to stay for the X years it's going to last, and deals with the issues like Luke explained, the turbine which is broken, the employer who's refusing to approve design, etc., and render final decisions, not preliminary binding but, or temporarily binding, but finding <coughs> along the way of the project. Of course, you can't do that in global time extension claim and these sort of things, but there are lots of claims that could be decided quickly. And if you have a commitment from the arbitrators um, to intervene within very short periods of time, you can solve all this in a way that's not going to, to grow and mushroom at the end and certainly will not slow the construction itself but as i said it's considered that if you do that well you lose money up front because you know we could have negotiated it without lawyers well no you won't so <laughs> let's face it uh, it's an investment not a, a you know, <clears throat> spending of money maxime yeah just maybe on uh, what you said uh, I want to make a link with what was proposed yesterday during the meeting of the, the uh, ICC Commission Arbitration in EDR. I keep having in uh, that kind of project a standing mediator exactly for the same reasons. So I just, just want to make yeah. a link. And it's not incompatible with the DAB huh? because no. we can have a first you know, screening by the DAB and then either the mediator or the arbitral tribunal standing there, ready to intervene uh, when the parties uh, feel they have the need to speedy resolution in one way or the other. Absolutely. And, and, and the idea was actually to, let's say, replace a district board. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you. Um, we, uh, we have some time for uh, questions for uh, uh, all of you to our speakers. Yes. Uh, this is Luc from Vries, from Amsterdam. I was wondering, uh, Maria, I ran you uh, were discussing this uh, project in Genoa, which, uh, which within uh, 1134 at that time was completed. I know that the title of the session is What Went Wrong. But uh, I was wondering if you could enlighten us a little bit on what went so right there and whether you had company evaluated it also with outside counsel and a good session on lessons learned, what went right and how do we in our next project make it such a success again? Uh, as I was saying, uh, well, first of all, disclaimer, I, I take care of Europe and America's excluding Italy. It's not directly my project, but it's so talked about in the company that of course comes up. I didn't follow it day by day, but I know what happened. And I was saying like the special element in the project was the, the employer. So the employer was much more flexible when the constructor asked for not additional time, but additional money. So the employer was much more flexible on an additional cost side and providing not 100%, of course, because you cannot understand, like we just, just bleed on a project. But it was much more understandable when we explained, listen, we really want to make you happy and finish on time. We're doing 300% because really it was like 24 hour working for 15, 15 months, except for one day, that's quite exceptional. But like all this additional effort was mostly paid off. So that was the employer who was more, more flexible and more understanding in terms of paying the additional costs that was actually, um, that were actually incurred. So I would say, yeah, mostly. Money was magic. Exactly, <laughs> money makes it easier. <laughs> Anyone else? Maybe we can, yes. <clears throat> Earlier, you mentioned the composition of a DAB, the ideal composition. Mm -hmm. My experience is that um, when you get two technical people and one legal who just listens and then formulates it in the right way so that it won't be maybe later uh, contested with these issue, legal issues, it was always a, a, the best solution because often, and that's why even you know, for uh, adjudicators, sometimes they, uh, they're not accepted as such because they say, as, as you said, they don't understand. Uh, they don't understand anything. Whereas, if you take people from the field, then 
it's easier and for the reward is much more uh, much more successful and acceptable. True, but on that specific case, we're looking also for um, the legal party of the, of the panel to also have construction experience. So not just listening in, but also understanding what what, what was the matter, the matter at hand. Because again, the, the deeper the technical issue is, the more experience you need to understand this. Sometimes people feel that they will come in and explain everything. <laughs> However, when you're dealing with commissioning or part plan, the level of detail is really, really, really deep. And this is a common, uh, actually, uh, critique of arbitration sometimes, that arbitrators may not have a sufficient technical background and understanding and knowledge to determine um, yeah, complex uh, technical uh, technical issues. Where mediation is concerned, uh, I think mediation is 90% 90, <coughs> 90 if not more uh, psychology. psychology. It's not going to be and understanding the issue is one thing, but then it's a lot of, as you mentioned, a matter of ego, because deep down they know what the situation mm -hmm. is. And also mediations for uh, amounts that, in my experience, go over 10 million, is always uh, more difficult to accept. They, they're not easier, they accept up to 10, 12 million, they accept uh, a deal. Also mediation where you have, uh, as in your case, um, public bodies, well, they have to do it, but they're not very happy because they know someone up there may say, oh, how come you accept it? And that's why in Poland they do something very intelligent. There is the mediation organism is approved by the, uh, the state advocates, basically. So the, the Ministry of Justice itself created this mediation organism. That was in Italy. Poland. I'm Poland, Poland. No, but I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. No, of course, like media. Wait, settling with a state entity is extremely complicated, especially if the dispute already started. And that's why I think the Polish Minister of Justice had a quite good idea, basically telling their ministers, "Don't worry, this you can do it because I approve it." So, and a couple of the settlements out of the seven were also they also went through a judge approval to be like a hundred percent like uh, correct. But it's another country, so I think that's yeah. very country specific. Mm. But good experience. Mm. Chapel. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I have a question from um, I just want to make a comment. We are all talking about dispute resolution, but nobody is talking about dispute prevention. Yes. Why don't we make some more sort of, um, you know, studies before actually signing a contract and put the project into its right perspective? And I'm, now I'm talking uh, with an engineer sort of part. Why don't you actually say to your clients that probably this project cannot be completed in six months, for example, okay? Or, or that it cannot be completed with that amount of money and probably we need some more money to complete. I mean, probably this is from where we should begin before actually getting to dispute resolution. Dispute prevention by risk assessment and risk monitoring and actually spending a bit more time with the sunset clause, which is, which is the dispute resolution clause, so that we get the right in case that we have a dispute, probably preventing it before becoming a dispute instead of actually, you know, sort of talking about dispute resolution in the end. Oh, absolutely. But, you know, in 98% of the time, I'm convinced that the client knows better than we do that he can't do it in six months and that his budget is going to explode. They know it. They still bid for it, they still go for it, and they know they're going to claim at the end to try and make it up. So there's also a bit of game there. I don't mean to say that it's always the case, but usually they have a much better feeling than I would ever have as to whether or not it's possible. But it's the pressure of the market, right? And it's also the fault of the employer to choose the cheapest one and the shortest one all the time, especially when it's obvious it's not going to work. But it still happens. And of course, when you start like that, you're bound to have disputes. And you're not going to be able to avoid it because otherwise there's going to be money missing somewhere. 
also the, the mindset is so different when you are at the beginning or the bidding or the tendering of the project you're looking at the project itself you want to complete it when you want to complete it you want you want to spend the budget that you have and disputes is not something that you're concerned with at that very stage i mean we have tried to address issues that should actually be taken into account at those early stages and throughout the project to avoid disputes but it's true that the mindset is very different it's the deadline that has to be met within um, a certain a certain budget so uh, but I, especially you know. the risk so of course like i can speak for my company i spend a ton of money and time on risk assessment it's not that i'm not doing it but they're risks they're not facts no one has a crystal ball so i would say 80 percent of the disruption we encounter we could not see from the beginning yeah. how can i know that the employer gave me the wrong geological information <coughs> i have to trust it and then you go there and do the countdown and like oh jesus Christ, yeah. Yeah. actually there, there are two points if i made there are two points on this first of all the contractor cannot spend can only spend so much money to do pre-engineering before actually winning the job you can't design the whole job without actually having the job <laughs> yes, and and and, sec and secondly, when someone is actually bidding for a project and they put forward a really aggressive time schedule, it's a matter of months where you will see the first claim for an extension of time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the commercial yeah. position is not that the project is feasible, is that we will win the job and then we'll figure this out. Yes. And be totally negative and yes. we'll be hitting, yes. hitting the employer with all the types of claims. And I do, I, I think yes. these examples, are, they're more just emphasizing this whole mindset point. I mean, you, you right. pick the geological information. Yeah. The employers employ people specifically for that job. Yeah. They give it over to you, and there's a contractor, you say, well, okay, we'll rely on it. And the employer says, no, you can't, because we want a single point of responsibility. So your response, presumably, as a contractor, is, okay, well, we're going to have to do it ourselves. Um, oh, no, I'm not going to pay for that. So there's this whole, I mean, sometimes I think you just have to be, there has to be more commerciality. Yeah. Uh, there's something else. As a contractor, you're under the pressure to use your equipment use your people because if you lose two three bids and then you suddenly whether you show as a as a turnover uh, in a certain country so i have to use it and i'll see later how i get my money yeah i have a question a little bit related to esg because there's a lot of talk about transparency uh that the board sets certain values that the company should live up to and something is also the, re the reputational issue. So a company that all the time runs into dispute, disputes, is it a lesser chance actually that they will get a contract because those who will employ them will see problems coming? No, I can speak for me, that not really. In the, in the sense that I also assist the bidding department, of course not formulate the, the offer, that's absolutely secret. And by the way, it's another building, so that's extremely delicate. But I assist them when they have to fill in questions from the employer like this one, because one of the typical questions is, were you ever terminated? Yes, of course, blah, blah, blah. Did you take any self-cleaning measure? No, because blah, 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 blah. But we are always 100% transparent. We have our list of disputes, we have our list of termination, where, of course, we always say it was not our fault. That's why. And, uh, we continue winning tenders, so knock on woods. It's, uh, it's. I think it's, as I was saying, it's a bit normal <laughs> to have this kind of uh, disputes, and especially because we were saying risks are really mostly unforeseeable. So things happen, and uh, I think it's a game. Employer contractors know, so yeah. However, we had another case where the contractor was building two contracts contracts for the same employer one was uh, was uh, doing okay and the other was actually experiencing delays so when the dispute arose on the bad project if you like it actually affected the good project as well yeah. because the employer was the same and the same people were actually dealing to, to a degree with both projects and it started they started actually losing touch with with their counterparts because they were having they were fighting over the other project and, and the problems so uh, yeah, in a way, it can affect you if you want to to have multiple uh, jobs with the same same employer. But uh, apart from that, again, yeah, yeah, contracts and companies they work different parts of the world. So 
And one more question, uh, just a crystal ball question. Uh, energy disputes, we're talking about this hydrogen economy and all the construction of hydrogen projects. What would you see would be the biggest disputes that will arise from these problems? Of course, apart from that the deadlines are completely unrealistic. The fact that the specifications will not be met. Hydrogen, there is still question marks, I think. I agree, design. Yeah. Design. So practically, you, you, how can you predict how much time you need for design or for installation when you don't even know the technology itself? Yeah, I think it's just it's still mm. new technology, and you're going to run into all the issues with the new technology. And that's what I'm quite surprised with the amount of money which is invested in hydrogen production, because I'm not sure that the technology is mature yet. But you know, entrepreneurial means taking risks and people do take risks but i would consider that as a risky business but why not we need to we'll invest in it i suggest we uh we continue discussing uh over a glass of wine and uh, something to eat uh, i uh, i invite you all to go um to move uh, next door i want to thank you again Francoise, dan maria Elena, and luke this was um, fun and uh, I enjoyed hearing everything that you had to say. Thank you very much.